turning again this evening to Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. I'll read the verses 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Well, last time we noted from verse 12 that grace, the message of grace and salvation, in other words, the grace of God, it trains us. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The word train or teach there is the chastened word from Hebrews. It speaks of powerful constraint. And the best way perhaps we can illustrate this is to think of Acts chapter 2, when the apostle Peter preached uh, to that vast company gathered in Jerusalem and through his ministry they were first convicted of their awful sin of crucifying the Lord and then they cried out saying men and brethren what shall we do and ultimately having been brought to faith in Christ we read that they continued steadfastly in the apostles teaching it was grace that convicted them. It was grace that moved them to yield to the lordship of Christ. And it was grace then uh, that gave to them that sense of desire to know the will of their new saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace trains in a powerful, irresistible manner. But here in verse 13, we are given a second moving influence uh, to deny the old life, to disavow it, and to pursue with diligence to live godly lives. And that is hope. Looking for that blessed hope, that happy hope. So yeah, we could translate the word blessed. It means Perhaps more than the way we use the word happy today, it means something deep and substantial, something that will afford lasting joy and satisfaction. But hope, what an encouragement it is to know that beyond this world we have that glorious anticipation of being with our Saviour, a sight by faith, in our mind's eye now of what that day will be when Christ receives us into his home or that day when Christ will appear in the clouds in great glory surely that should excite our souls to deny this present world and its sinful ways and to say with the help of the Lord I desire to live a life which is well-pleasing to him. I said last time, just as we closed, that the word looking for here it is rare in the New Testament, but it's the word that was used to describe Simeon, anticipating the coming of the Messiah. He'd had it revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He knew that he would not die before the Savior appeared, with what earnestness, with, with what care and inquiry and reflection, perhaps, he thought about the appearance of the Messiah long promised from the Old Testament prophets. And the apostle here is saying, that is the spirit that we are to have as believers. We are to reflect, anticipate, and happily look forward to 
the coming of our Savior with the same confidence, conviction, persuasion that Simeon had concerning the first appearing of Christ. Looking for then, but looking for what? Here it's described firstly as that blessed hope, that happy hope. But how can we look for something which is just hope? Hope is a, an action. Hope is something that we do. When the apostle uses this phrase here, he doesn't so much meaning mean the hope itself, but the object of that hope the thing that is hoped for. He calls it our hope, but what he means is the thing that we hope for. And it's called a blessed hope uh, because it is associated with so many causes of blessing and happiness. He means, of course, that time when we shall be united to our Lord and Saviour. And he goes on in a moment to explain in more detail the glorious appearing of our Saviour. It will be a time when we are free from the curse, a time when we see the Lord Jesus Christ in his magnificence with our eyes, such as we have never seen him by faith. It will be that time when we are welcomed into those mansions prepared for those that love the Lord, It will be the day when our bodies will be adapted and glorified for that sinless world which is yet to come. Is it not then a blessed hope? It most certainly is. And we are to look for it. So many times in the New Testament, our brother Daniel recently pointed out that in the first letter of the Thessalonians, every chapter has reference to the return of Christ. It's throughout the New Testament, and brothers I, and sisters, I think there is, it, the reality is that we do not dwell upon this theme as often as we should. If we began every day reflecting upon the absolute certainty and imminence of Christ's return, surely it would shape our day. It would hold us up and bear us up in those times of uh, when we are uh, despondent. It would serve as a check uh, even in those times of prosperity because we would know that earthly prosperity is of nothing in comparison to the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. But probably here, though Paul has in mind above everything else when he says the blessed hope He means the object of hope, the thing that we hope for. He's also speaking perhaps just a little of the activity of hoping as well. Sometimes people say, we've probably all said this, well, sometimes I like to know in advance about some happy future event because I get almost as much enjoyment out of anticipating it and looking forward to it as the event itself. My family have sometimes said to me, don't book the holiday a week before we go. Book it early, because then we can think about it and enjoy it. I'm sure if we are separated in courtship from our loved one, and then we know that a day is coming when we shall be brought together and spend time with each other. We know the day itself will be a happy day, but there is also a sense of gladness and happiness in looking forward to that day when we shall spend time together. And so that is true here as well. It's a blessed hope because of what it will be, but it's also a source of blessing in the very anticipation of it as believers. As we go through life, can you imagine what it would be to be in some dark, cold dungeon? Our liberty removed from us, 
because of our love for Christ? What would uphold our spirits? The thought of our Saviour's return, the comfort that it brings, but even the joy in the thinking of it. What are we looking? That's what the Apostle exhorts us to here. Be those who are looking for that blessed hope. Grace almost trains us to look for that hope. If we've known his touch and his presence in our heart by his Spirit, Paul says that's just a mere earnest. It's the deposit, the down payment. But having known something of the Lord's presence by his Spirit, we say, oh, for the day when I shall see him as he is and know him even as I am known. To look for him surely means that we have frequent thought and anticipation of that day. The looking soul who truly has half an eye even to the return of the Lord is not too bound up with the things of earth. And we are, aren't we, so often? Whether it be the excitement of prosperity or, or the fears and sorrows of disappointment, if our eyes are up unto the Lord and we exercise hope of that far better day, then it will temper both our prosperity and our despondency. The looking soul is anxious to be ready when the Lord shall appear. Surely that's part of the emphasis here. How can I go back to the old life? How can I allow some of its former sinful pleasures and habits take fresh root in my life if I am looking for the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm seeking to be ready that I should not be ashamed before him at his coming, then that will prevent so much temptation. The Apostle Paul says, uh, sorry, the Apostle John says, every man that has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. If we think of it often, it will have such a sanctifying influence in our lives. If we look for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we shall think much of him and we shall desire to know all that there is to know about him. Do I believe that he is to appear and when he appears, he will be looking for me and he will be use his divine power to raise me to himself then surely I cannot live on earth oblivious to all that I can know now of the things of Christ the person that has a closed Bible and a closed mind who's not interested in studying the word of God hearing it taught can just survive on the occasional sermon is that person truly looking by faith and with hope to the return of Christ? Surely not. Because if we think that we are going to meet such an illustrious saviour, we shall say, I must know now all that I can. The very thought that I shall be with him awakens my interest and whets my appetite. If we look forward to be being forever with the Lord's people, then surely we shall want to be with the Lord's people now. If we anticipate that day of rest, that eternal Sabbath as it is called, then surely we shall be more diligent in our master's business now, knowing that the reward of that diligence and that exercise of obedience and service is to know the sweet rest of being with our Saviour. But let's return to these words. The Apostle says not only looking for that blessed hope, but adds, and the glorious appearing 
of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and doesn't in one sense separate the hope and the appearing. They're one and the same thing. And here means perhaps especially concerning our future hope, the appearing of our great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, of whom is the apostle referring to here? That there's a, I wouldn't say a debate, that's too strong a word, but there is a discussion as to whether the apostle here is referring to one person or two. Is it God the Father and our Saviour Jesus Christ? Or are these two titles for one and the same person? The great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Well, there are many who read this passage and they would argue that these are two titles for one person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who we look for, but he is at the same time, and he will be evidently on that return, day of return the great God himself. That's theologically true, and many would argue that the apostle, if he didn't intend to be stating that, used language which to any other meaning is quite misleading. The, gramma, the grammar here lends support to the idea that this is one person. There is only one article, as it's known, in the original here, the great God and our Saviour. It doesn't say the great God and the Saviour. Two articles, only one the. Our Bible here reflects that. There's only one our. It doesn't say our great God and our Saviour. Some of the translations rephrase this. Our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And contextually, there is quite strong support for the idea that this is one person referred to the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, being one person. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we don't read of the return of God in glory in the clouds. It's always the return of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will appear as the judge of all the earth. It is Christ who will come in like manner as he was viewed by the apostles returning. Nevertheless, John Calvin, when he reads this phrase, he stops short of saying, well, this absolutely means one person. He, but, he says, there is no doubt that this verse confirms the absolute Godhead of Christ. Why? Because even if here there is a reference to God the Father and God the Son. They both share equal glory. The glorious appearing of both. Equal in glory. And so the long and short of it, you could say, is that at the very, the very least, this verse is declaring that Christ will appear in that day as divine, possessing all the glory of the Godhead. He will appear as our triumphant God, all-conquering, having subdued all his and our enemies. He will appear to reign eternally on the behalf of his church and people. What a glorious thought the apostle is setting before us here. We look for him. And in a moment he's going to say, him who has redeemed us at great cost. But we look for him and he will appear equal with the Father, 
in all the power and glory of heaven. What a thrill that would have been to these early disciples, those who were slaves in the Roman Empire, who were often abused by their masters, believers who were in fear, living in fear of some despotic Caesar's next decree that would feed them to the lions, and they would know that at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Saviour would appear as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the only true potentate, the absolute monarch of the universe. But he will appear not only in his divinity, he will appear also in his manhood. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. As the bridegroom for his bride, as the shepherd for his sheep, as the captain of our salvation. This, this verse is so rich in doctrine, important doctrines for us, friends. Firstly, we have here what we call substitutionary atonement. We must be aware that in our days there are those that deny that Christ's death was anything more than an example of submission and suffering. But his death was far more. It's heresy when Steve Chalk and people like that who claim to be Baptists reject the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. He gave himself for us. He died in our place. There was a mighty and glorious transaction that took place on Calvary's cross when he interposed himself in order to deliver us from the awful penalty, the eternal penalty of our sin and its guilt. So there's substitutionary atonement, but there is also here limited atonement. He gave himself for everybody. It's not the language of this verse. He gave himself for us, for his people, for those that he is appointed to die for, who would come to believe in him in due time. He gave himself. If he gave himself for all men, then surely his atoning work was only half a success. Think of it. Those who think Christ died for all men, they are arguing that either hell is empty or hell is full of people for whom Christ has already paid the price of their sin. It's not consistent with scripture. Christ gave himself for his people that he might redeem them. The word redeem would have been well understood by the slaves and servants referred to in verses 9 and 10. They knew that they were bound to their masters unless redeemed, unless some merciful benefactor or another master came and purchased them. A price must be paid. A transaction must be engaged in before they could be redeemed. And the word redeem here, it especially refers to the payment of a price. And we know here that that price is the life of Christ himself. But I want to notice from what we are redeemed from all iniquity. Sin is viewed here as a cruel master. Just as the servant slave was to be redeemed from his master, the sinner is redeemed from the mastery of sin itself. Sin dominates it reigns over us. 
it uh, dictates our thinking processes, our agenda, our priorities. Some are under the dominion of the sin of lust and unclean thoughts and impure desires and it, di and it dictates the whole of their behavior. Others are dominated by the sin of selfishness and pride. It's all about me and getting for myself what I want. Some are do dominated by, uh, by rage or envy. All of us here, before we were saved, we realized that we were under the dominion of sin, of some particular sin, perhaps, that we couldn't break free from. Some, it would be covetousness. I must have more. I must have this. I must have that. One thing is acquired. We move on to the next one. Never satisfied. Like a leech that just keeps sucking. But when the apostle speaks here of being redeemed from all iniquity, he's not speaking so much about the guilt of our sin as the power and the dominion of our sin. That's what Paul especially has in mind in this verse, I believe, because of what he then goes on to say. Christ sets us free from the mastery of those besetting sins that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people. What does this word mean? It's a very unusual word, not used many times in the Bible. Peculiar is how it's been translated in our English Bible. Does it mean special? Some translations have special but actually special doesn't fully reflect the sense here. It's not so much that we are distinct and different to other people. It does mean that. The word here is probably borrowed from Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Let me read you this verse. You needn't turn to it. Where the Lord says to the Israelites... Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. And this word, it has the idea in it of being over and above. Something that belongs to the Lord over and above others. Same word is used in Deuteronomy 14.2. Very similar language. And Paul is probably alluding back to that. God had his special possession in the Old Testament. His national treasure. His people that his eye was upon. That he protected. That he unusually blessed. That he gave singular favours to. And here... The apostle is saying, now you who are Christ's, you are his possession over and above everyone else. What a privilege to be the objects of his special favor. Some would say that the idea here is of a special treasure, just as a lady may have treasure that she cherishes above all her jewels, because there is some sentimental attachment to it. Christ, the apostle is saying here that Christ views his people as being that special treasure to himself. He's given himself for her. She is his peculiar possession, his bride. She is to him over and above what anything else can ever be to him. Do we have the right mindset when we think of this, friends? If we've been called by grace, we've come to repent of our sin, to cast ourselves upon Christ, to yield to him as our Lord 
to trust in his atoning work at Calvary when he gave himself for sinners like us, then do we then say, I now understand that Christ has done for me what I've never deserved. I am his peculiar possession. Paul says elsewhere, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. We're not our own friends. If we believe we are Christians, then we understand I'm not my own. I belong to him. His will, not mine, must come first in my life. His honor, not mine, must be my ultimate desire. All that I am, all that I have, all the time that he affords, I use as stewards of Jesus Christ because I am his. He is mine to be my Lord and Savior, but I am his. He's redeemed me at great cost. That's the mindset of a genuine New Testament believer. I must live for him. I must seek above all to please him and to advance his cause and kingdom. We cannot simply sit back and say, well, it's a wonderful thought to know that all my sin has been effaced, washed away, and that I can look forward to that blessed hope that Christ will claim me as his own when he appears, but now I'll just get on with my life, knowing that I have that peace with God within. That's impossible. Christ redeemed us from all iniquity. He paid for us. We belong to him. He delights over us in such a special way. But now he calls us to live for him, to serve him, to labor for him. Look at this last phrase. With this we'll close. That we might be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He went about doing good. How much more ought we to imitate him? Not simply here good works, but zealous of good works. Paul knew what this word meant. He used it more than almost anyone else in the New Testament. He said that he was once in his unconverted state, zealous for God, the God of his fathers. And we know what that meant. The zeal of his persecution. The word means heat. It means, to, in one sense, to be hot-headed, but here in a good sense, to have a heart so warmed, uh, so on fire uh, for the honor and, and glory and for the cause of Christ that I will strive for good works. Now, Brownlow North, I said this was my last point, and it's connected to it. Brownlow North was uh, an evangelist, in the 1850s, I think in Belfast particularly, but in Scotland. And he published six short rules for young Christians. I'll share these as we close. Rule number one, never neglect daily private prayer. And when you pray, remember that God is present and that he hears your prayers. Number two, never neglect daily private Bible reading. And when you read, remember that God is speaking to you and that you are to believe and act upon what he says. I believe, he says, all backsliding begins with the neglect of these two rules. Have we neglected them? If we say, well, if I'm honest, I have. Brownlow North would say, you started to backslide. Wake up. Rule number three, never let a day pass without trying to do something for Jesus. Every night, reflect on what Jesus has done for you and then ask yourself, what am I doing for him? Rule four, if you are in doubt as to a thing being right or wrong, go to your room, kneel down and ask God's blessing upon it. If you cannot do this, it is wrong. Rule number five, 
Never take your Christianity from Christians or argue that because such and such people do so and so that therefore you may. You are to ask yourself, how would Christ act in my place and strive to follow him? And lastly, never believe what you feel if it contradicts God's word. Ask yourself, can what I feel be true if God's word is true? And if both cannot be true, believe God and make your own heart the liar. Now, you, you got more than you bargained for there, but the third rule, never let a day pass without doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be zealous of good works. Well, let's close our worship with hymn 478.